Hi, and welcome to Business Today, show number 23. Last week, John Hughes talked talking passion. Andrew spoke about marketing. Helia was change your luck. And Anne-Marie talked about self-regulation. Week. John Hughes talks about self-confidence, Andrew Ford about staff happiness, Helia sings about taking a chance, and Andrew self-regulation part number two, and Colleen takes us into the Perth Hills. Well, welcome back to another show on business today. Geez, we've got some great guests coming up today, Gerard. Especially, I think, after last week, I think the standard, they said hi for today. Oh, <laughs> so we keep raising the benchmark, don't we? I think there's something, because people say, well, you're getting in front of cameras, you do all this. But there is a thing in your business about getting in front and actually being able to talk to people. And right off the bat, John Hughes is going to be talking about self-confidence today, Gerard. Your self-confidence is so important. Mm. And the more you know about yourself, yeah. um, the more you know about business, the more self-confident you can be. Yeah, I think it is really, really important. I, I guess it takes a little bit of practice. It takes a little bit of yeah. decision-making. Uh, you said last week we had a few people respond for your scissor technique. And I think that really does help with decision-making courses. It might be worth just running through that again, because I do think that helps with decision-making. Well, especially when, when you run into a situation you don't know how to, to handle, this, this scissor uh, method works really well because you look at that and see what can I change, what can I improve, what can I create, or what must I remove to make this thing work. So when you have strategies, it also gives you the self-confidence to make a decision. Yeah. So let's hear from the man himself, John Hughes, about self-confidence. Okay, here we are with Mr. John Hughes. One of the things I've heard you say, John, to be successful in business is to have self-confidence. And you seem to have had it for a long, long time. Well, I don't know that you're necessarily born with it, but, uh, you know, I believe that self-confidence comes out like perspiration on a hot day. You don't need to pound your chest or raise your voice and tell people how good you are. If, if you've got it, they will know it. Now, where did it start? I think one of the most significant... Uh, inputs for me in, in terms of confidence when in, as an early teenager I was a, a student at the Christian Brothers College in Fremantle that was Fremantle was a rough tough town or city in those days and CBC was run by the Christian Brothers and they were tough disciplinarians because my mother had kept me too long in a convent by the time I went down to that big rough tough school all the boys had been together for a number of years they'd formed their own groups and I was a bit nervous and used to stutter and stammer somewhat a little bit. And I was the odd one out. But I remember something that happened to me in that school that I've never, ever forgotten. We're involved uh, in the physics laboratory, benches down both sides, a bench along the back, 26 boys in the class. I happened to be up the back in the right-hand corner. What you had to do was dissolve some powder in a liquid in a test tube. There was some of the powder left. It was called um, precipitation. You had to calculate arithmetically how much of the powder was left. 26 boys in the class. I'm up the back in the right-hand corner. The brother said, I want you to work out your answer. I want you to write your answer down and don't speak till I point to you. And if some of us can remember, that's the way they used to run schools, with discipline. So I write down point double O one. Last boy in the corner. Everybody got their answer written down? Yes, brother, don't uh, speak till I point to you. No, brother. Remember, I'm point double O one. Points to the boy on the left-hand bench. Call out your answer, point O one. Second boy, point O one. Third boy, point O one. Fourth boy, ducks of the class the previous year, point O one. Point O one, point O one, point O one, point O one. Twenty-five times that it comes to the new boy in the corner. He said, call out your answer. And Michael, for some unknown reason, whatever it was, I bit the bullet and stuttered out 0 0.001. They all turned around and jeered at me. The dummy, the new boy in the corner, 
I was right. I've never forgotten that. You stand up to be counted. You're not a sheep that falls in with Eunice with, with all the other sheep. You don't fall in line. You don't buckle under peer pressure. Stand up for yourself. You're better to be obdurate and obstinate rather than weak and vacillating. And I am a point double O one, and I'll never, ever forget it. I think that reflects in you when you came to the, the car business. You said, this is my standard. Even though a lot of other people were saying, you're mad. It hmm. cost you too much money, John. You're starting in business, you mean? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I borrowed, well... I used to wake up, I was, I was an employee in the car business. I was managing, but I was an employee. I was early 30s. I used to wake up in the mornings, most mornings, around three or four o'clock with a knot in my gut. I had all the tests, went to the doctors. I couldn't find anything wrong, but the knot in my gut persisted. I'd only recently got married and I'd borrowed the deposit to buy the house. I had no money. And then I saw advertised in the paper and auction for a service station site at 196 Albany Highway, Victoria Park, just over the causeway. Um, so I didn't go to the auction because obviously I didn't have any money. So I rang up the auctioneer the next day, hoping that they'd tell me that it had been sold to get the monkey off my back, but it hadn't. So I didn't sleep too well the next night and I rang them up the next day and I made them an offer they couldn't possibly accept. I forget the figure now, I forget what it was. 5% deposit in 60 days, another 5% in another 60 days, the balance in 120 days after that. They couldn't possibly do it. They couldn't possibly accept it. So I slept well that night. Well, of course, then they rang me the next morning and said it was yours. <laughs> and I didn't have the money, Michael. I had to get my briefcase and walk up and down St George's Terrace and borrowed 120% of what I needed, which you could do in those days. But... As soon as I'd made that decision, as soon as the, one of the biggest decisions financially, it's probably the biggest decision of my life, the minute, I'd t the minute I'd totally overwhelmed myself with debt, that knot in my gut went away. It was my body telling me, John, you're not destined to work for other people. And I've got to tell you, Michael, seriously, your body is your best doctor. You listen to it. Mm. Well, John certainly knows a thing about self-confidence. <laughs> Well, we've been in business for 50 years, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Another man who knows a lot about business is our next guest coming up, Mr. Andrew Ford. What's Andrew talking about this week, Gerard? Let's talk about staff happiness. Oh. <laughs> and you know, I always say, you know the saying, you know, um, happy wife, happy life. I think in business, happy staff, happy life. <laughs> <laughs> happy business. Look, I think Andrew really does, at an, uh, you know, I've been down to Andrew. This is what you get when you, you go live, you get all tongue-tied. But you go down to Andrew's place there with him and Kyle and you meet the staff. They just all love being there. I think the, the culture and what he talks about in this segment, I think is really, really powerful. But it's, it's, like you say, the culture is, but it's also the atmosphere in the office. You know, when you mm. go for a lunch break, there's a table tennis where people can go and can relax. Yeah. Um, I worked for an international company up in Denmark. Um, and when you go and visit up there, there's places for people, if they feel, you know, they, they, they need a break, there's spaces for them to go and relax. Mm. So if you look after your staff, you know, people appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, welcome back. I'm here with uh, Andrew Ford, Ford and Doon and Excess Fitness. Last time you were in, Andrew, we actually talked about marketing and being famous for something. Uh, now, I've been down to, I haven't been to Excess Fitness, but I've certainly been down to Ford and Doon and I've walked through the offices. And my wife made the comment when we were down there. She said, this is one of the few places I've been where everyone is happy to be here. Mm. They don't want to go home. And we're talking like a COVID thing coming on. How? You said famous for marketing, but how have you made that? Yeah, well, that is one of our values, core values, is um, have fun at work. And that came from, again, another podcast or book I've forgotten now some years ago, mm. where, again, it's just a matter of people, you've got to have, enjoy what you're doing. And if you enjoy what you're doing, you're going to do it a lot better. And that care is going to come out to the customer and that fun. And customers love being around people who are happy and smiling oh. and laughing as opposed yeah. to you know, hating their job and dragging themselves around the office looking at their watch to go home. So yeah. it's, a, it's got to come largely from the business owner, I think, this, to encourage the fun. 
and we've got a general manager, Barry, who's a bit of a goose. He's just a funny guy. <laughs> he used to be uh, in, his, in his younger days um, playing guitars on the streets and that sort of thing. So he's a bit of a, uh, what would you call it, a, a, an actor, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But he'll just do the silliest thing and taken out of context, you'd go, the guy's an idiot. But what it does in context is it just lifts the esteem of the whole place when he makes it, like he'd do a reading. We, we, he hasn't done one for a while. So we adopted every day at a certain time, three o'clock in the afternoon, I think it was, he'd do a reading. And it might be a reading from a, a Buddhist type thing mm. or it might be a, a funny verse yeah. or something like that and he'd say attention attention over the over the intercom over everyone's phone and everyone would sort of uh, go quiet and it might only be a 30 second quote and people would sometimes ponder what, what did he actually mean by that but it, he became oh. famous for it and everyone often would just laugh afterwards so it just yeah. lightened it all up when the mood gets too serious no i must say there'd be a few business owners out there saying but they're not working. They've mm. stopped working to listen to that and now they're having a laugh after this. I'm, you know, <laughs> look at, look what's happening. Yep. You haven't done that. No, and I think that's very much a, I don't know what era that was from, but I don't think it's <laughs> relevant to the 21st century. Um, yeah, I think that's very old school type management. And yeah. I don't think, it certainly doesn't resonate with the younger generation. You know, yeah. they happily work longer hours and just do that little bit. If you haven't been, you know, tight with them and a bit of a prick for them all day, saying, yeah. you know, lunch is over. I don't really care whether they finish, take an extra 15 minutes, but I expect them if they haven't finished something that needs to be done, that they won't be looking at their clock at five o'clock and walking out. They'll finish what they're doing and walk out at 10 past five. Yeah. So we've been very much a give and take type employer. You certainly have. I mean, even in the uh, back area there where you've got the table tennis table set up. Yep. Now, I know you're even guilty of this. You've come in and gone, oh, it's been a tough day. And you'll drag one of the staff members to play you at table yeah. tennis. <laughs> <laughs> they never say no, actually. Um, I, no, no I, we started that um, for our sundowners. We have sundowners once a month on a Friday afternoon. Yep. And you can tell they're getting a bit stale. You know, there's not much happening. So we got a dartboard, table tennis table, yep. ran a little tournament. So just again, trying to bring some fun back into the workplace. Because let's face it, we humans all like fun. We certainly do. So there we are. So one of your main values, apart from having fun with clients, but fun at work and make it fun for your staff, that's why they hang around. They just don't leave you. I've looked at the records yeah. of longevity. It's like, and, and I know they've gone on holidays, come back, got pregnant, come back. Yeah, or even resigned and come back. We've had well, a few many said, of those. Yes, yeah, few have actually said to me, you know, the grass was not greener mm -hmm. on the other side. That is, a, and I know we're a bit short of time, but that is interesting. They leave to go somewhere else and you've never stopped them coming back. You haven't closed the door. Only the good ones. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, we well, never have because normally the ones that want to come back are the ones we want to have come back. back. They know, you know, as much as we know. Yeah. So, um, and it's really good that they've gone out. And as you said, the grass wasn't great. The green, grass Thank wasn't you. any greener because when they come back, what they thought may have been an issue working for us, they realise it isn't an issue. That is nothing. And there's so many other benefits to it. Wow. Um, and we welcome them back. And they yeah. normally bring in some new skill sets at the same time. Often they would have worked for a, someone in a different sector of our industry, for example. Mm. So when they do come back, they bring back additional skills as well. Yeah. I'm going to touch one more point. I am very conscious of your time on this one. But when I was talking to Carl, Carl Dooning, your, your business partner, and if someone wants to go overseas and explore the world, he is 100%. Go for it. Yeah. Jump. Come back when you get back, just go and explore the world. He has absolutely no problems with that whatsoever. No, because he did the same thing, I guess. And in his early 20s, he went on, oh, no, I can't remember, three months or something like that. Yeah. So he knows the value he got out of it. And he thinks it's an important part of life's journey before yeah. you, you know, settle down with kids and family and all that sort of thing to get that out of the way. I think he believes it makes you a better person. I haven't been through it, so I can't speak personally. Um, but yeah, he definitely encourages it. Yeah. Um, and we'll just give them, like, if they, there's much holiday they've got, then leave without pay and their job's waiting for them when they get back. Wow. It's a part of being part of Ford and June and probably Excess Fitness as well. It's all part of life's journey. It is. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> well, another great segment there by Andrew. Thank you so much for making the time to come in and film that. I'm sure everyone's getting a lot out of this. But while I guess come in, you have your famous 60 second question, Gerard. They, they don't escape this one. No, not even John Hughes could escape the 60 second question. <laughs> um, and the question we have is, what do you wish you had known um, when you first started your business? Um, I think it would be that I would be working much harder for much less money. Um, 
I say that tongue in cheek, but it is unfortunately the sad reality. But yet, um, there's a different color to that hard work. Um, it is an absolute relentless journey. And everything that you do or don't do shows up in your results. Um, in a corporate, you've got a whole system that forms part of, a, of the outcome. Um, and there's a lot of people that helps you carry that load um, in your business and especially just starting out, it's all up to you. So it's a huge responsibility. And again, the word relentless comes up. Um, so that would have to be it. Um, but I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. It's still the most amazing journey. Probably, I wish I'd known how much IT would have an influence on our everyday life and our business lives and done a bit more study on IT so I could be a bit more savvy than what I am. I wish I knew that everything will be okay and no need to stress. Just do your best and just focus on your service and don't worry about the outcome. The outcome will come. I absolutely love those questions. What I love about them is just the rawness yeah. of the answer that you get. Because people don't have time to think about it. No. First reaction. Yeah. I remember when you, you said to me, what was the first thing, you, you know, what would you like to have known when you first went into business? And I think when I had a, and I had about two seconds, I see you do it to other people, you did it to me. And uh, I went, you know what I wish I'd known? that you, you're actually allowed to change as you grow. Exactly. Uh, but, but for me, as well as I realise that as well, but to ask more questions. Yeah. Ask people that know. Yeah. So, you know, people who know me know I paint. And if I'd have known business was just like art, you can model it, which is just block it in, just get the main bits. And then you can start putting more detail yeah. and refinements. But, you know, in a, in a painting, you know, if I paint something and I don't like it, I just get a bit of paper towel and I rub it off. And I wish someone had told me that in business. Mm. If you don't like it, get rid of, of it. it. <laughs> and start over. And don't hang yep. on to it. Exactly. Yeah. Another person who does uh, a lot, and we've been following Helia Singh when she read that book about changing luck. I think changing luck is being able to change your mind and having the confidence and everything we've talked about today. And I think she summarizes today about take a chance. If you don't take a chance, nothing is going to change in your business. Mm. Um, and, and you know at a moment how quickly business change and how like an epidemic can change everything. And if you're not adaptable in changing, you're going to sink. Mm. Here she is, Miss Helia Singh. Do you consider yourself to be lucky or not? What's your definition of luck? Or have you ever wondered what is it to be born lucky and having life served to you on a golden platter? If you got any of these questions running in your mind, and I'm sure there must be a reason that you clicked on this video to watch, you are not alone. Until just recently, I used to think I'm not a lucky person. And I used to feel that, well, luck is only for a certain people. And to me, the definition was this, that you are either born with it or not. And we, I'm, in my, again, definition, I had three um, you know, sort of peoples. One was lucky people, which was, you know, uh, it was rich people. And then the unlucky people, which are the poor people. And then the middle class people, like me. So we are just there. So that, boy, every time I tried to do something and, you know, mm, uh, put the hustle in and the, despite all my efforts it felt something was out there to rub the happiness from me and life was just giving me and throwing me those curveballs to tell me that look you know you need to stay in this middle class you are a mediocre you can't just go up there just be happy and grateful for what you've got and that's it and that was very very frustrating for me so it felt that hey, life is just was, you know, a, a fate for some people and I had no control. And if you know me long enough, you know, that control, I always had that issue with it. Come on. I mean, I wanted to be in control of my life and know exactly what I want to do with it. So that's why we are talking about 
the luck factor today. My name is Helia Singh and today you are watching another episode of our Well TV. And today we are talking about luck, how to increase it, how to uh, manifest it in our life and how even to change our vibration around luck. Because only through luck we can increase our success, which is inevitably you know, end with wealth, which is from inside and also from outside. Most of this topic is a credit to the book that I read a few years ago and that called The Luck Factor by Richard Wiseman. I suggest you to read this book. You will learn a lot from it. That's just become like a, my mini Bible these days. <laughs> but first thing first, when it comes to luck, um, I want you to be open mind about it, that luck is something that we progress towards it. It's not something that you either get it or you don't get it. So it's a slow progress, but once you are there, that's it. Then you reach that abundance that you will receive luck from right and left is just coming to you. Hanging there, I'm going to explain to you what's happening. And if you are one of those people that, that think that success has got to do with luck, so of course there are many people feel this way, and it is true. Uh, like um, Julius Rosenwald, he is a, he was an American businessman and philanthropist. He said that 95% of success is actually luck, and 5% is ability. But people, not everybody get the chance to show their ability. So even a, a very successful and rich businessman is admit, me admitting that success has to do with luck. But luck is something we can create for ourselves. As a person with a mathematics background, I like to look at the correlation between luck and chance. So what do you think? Why do you think the chance and like when we say to people that, okay, this person is lucky, what is the word chance comes in there? Well, what a show. We've been talking about self-confidence. We've been talking about getting your staff happy, which you need to be confident. You have to be happy in yourself to make that happen. Your, what would you like to know in business? And I think it was the confidence and chain. We talked about different things like that. Helly has just taken us through about taking a chance. And it's this luck factor book that she yeah. read. Look, if you want to watch Helia's show, jump onto her YouTube channel. That was a segment out of her show, just to give you a taste of what that program is really like. It's getting very, very popular for very good reasons. Now, you take us to South Africa, and you've introduced us to Anne-Marie mm -hmm. over there, yep. and her business is Mind Skills. Yep. <laughs> yep. And, and Anne-Marie, uh, we, we listened to her last week, and this is part two uh, of her conversation. But Anne-Marie is so up-to-date with the latest what's going on in you know, science, in management, yeah. and staff. So you get the latest of what's out there. And this is part two Do of self-regulation. Again, all tying back into that self-confidence that John started off as off uh, right at the very beginning of the show. It's all about me. You as business owner, if it's not you that leads the people, nothing will happen. So this is for you. As we discussed before, self-regulation is a crucial skill for all of us to have, irrespective of who you are or what position you're in, whether you're a CEO, whether you're a team leader, business owner, when you're a partner, as soon as you are in interaction with another human being, you need to be able to self-regulate. Self-regulation is based on how we interpret life around us. How do we interpret what people say? How do we interpret a specific scenario that we find ourselves in? And this interpretation is really based on the state that we find ourselves in. We know that there's only two states, that's a towards state and an away state. As soon as I am in a towards state, I am open, I'm calm, I am confident, I will interpret things in a more positive way. However, on the other hand, as soon as I find myself in a more away state, and the reason for this might be that I don't quite trust a certain person or that I don't feel safe in a certain situation, 
I will go into an away state and I will interpret things and what people say in a more negative way. And this really is the brain doing its job because the brain's only job is on a very basic level to protect us. Hence the two states. Are you okay or aren't you okay? And if you're not okay, I'm going to protect you and I'm going to take you away and I'm going to help you to interpret things around you in a negative way because it's not going to serve you. So there are various ways in which we interpret things and what people say in a very negative way. I would like to share with you an example. It's a coaching example of a team leader that his team kept on challenging him openly. He was in a new position in, as this team leader and he felt that they disrespected him. So in coaching, we discussed this scenario and he actually in fact interpreted everything that his team did and the interaction between him and his team in a very negative way. What he realized is that he didn't feel safe yet and he didn't feel that he could trust himself and his team yet. Hence he went into a, an away state and he's, he had the tendency of interpreting everything in a more negative way. Again, this was just the brain doing its job. Now, the good news here is that there is hope and we do have the ability to control this initial interpretation of ours. We call that process reappraisal. So we re-evaluate our initial interpretation based on our state. And the way that we can reinterpret or reappraise is exactly that. It's called reinterpretation. It's one of the tools or techniques that I would like to share with you. It means that you have the ability to move yourself from an away state into a towards state and to move yourself out of that threat response and that you go into a more towards state so that you have the tendency to rather look at things in a more positive way and, and interpret things in a more positive way. One of these examples is when you walk towards um, one of the gates at the airport um, where you have to board, um, you think that you're late, that's your initial thinking, and you've got this fear response, what if I miss my flight? But as soon as you start walking slightly faster and you start seeing the gate, um, far away still, but you still see that the people are busy boarding, you immediately reinterpret and you move yourself from that state of fear to a state of it's okay. And you manage yourself. You don't break down. You have the ability to manage yourself. We, we do this all the time without even knowing it, reinterpreting. And that is the ability of us to downward regulate that emotional arousal. And that ability we call emotional regulation. That I think for all of us will serve us very well if we try and refine that skill because it is so important. Wow. What a packed show. I have really enjoyed it this week. I think it really does get to the core of business, especially when you're struggling. You've got to get that self-confidence, got to get that passion back in, taking a chance. But, but again, uh, even if you're a very successful business person, mm. all these things we spoke about today, you have to keep on working on those little things because it's all that 1% is we're all about that 1% change and that little thing. Yeah. I mean, just for example, with staff happiness, what is the one little thing that you can do today to change that your staff is happier? And it doesn't have to be giving bonuses. It can no. be like, you know what, I'm going to buy lunch today. Yeah. And if you are the staff, what is it you're going to do for you to make you happy? You know, we always talk about staff and employees, but some of us are self-employed. We are the staff. Yeah. What are we going to do today to make us happy? I'm taking you for a coffee, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> straight after the show. There you go. Um, I get two for one, so you know me. <laughs> it's been an absolutely fantastic show. Now, we have been supporting local, obviously trying to support local businesses and so forth. Colleen Yates from Regional Development Australia, Perth. There's a lot in this area. 
we've been following her. She's been going into the Perth Hills. I think we went to Lake Les and Alt over the last couple of weeks. Now she's going up to Mundaring in the Perth Hills to look at the art up there and the art centres and the art yeah. business in that area. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I hope people enjoy this one, Gerard. Again, for me, it's like you being painting and art. Um, you need sometimes something different to take your mind off. Yeah. And for me, it's going to look at art. It just gives my brain time to settle. So yeah. special episode today. So enjoy this trip into the Perth Hills, looking at art with Colleen Yates. And until next time, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Hello, I'm Colleen Yates, and I'm the CEO of Regional Development Australia, Perth. tour of the Perth Hills, we are now at the Mundaring Arts Centre, um, which has apparently been here for 40 years. Can you believe that? And we're here to talk to Jenny Hayes, who's the director of this particular centre. And Jenny, you've been here for 16 of those 40 years. Uh, why are people sticking around so long and what's so special? Um, I think the art centres, the thing that makes it so special is the people. And you know, we have fantastic local artists. I came here as a community arts officer and then was you know, really interested in our education programs and the artists that we represented and how that engaged with the community. Um, and that's kept me here, as, lo as well as all of the amazing people who are part of our community. So whether they be the, the participants in our programs, the artists that we represent, or the audience that comes to see our work. So as part of that 40 years, are a lot of the people who started the Art Centre, are they still participating? Yes, that's right. Wow. Yeah, so we have life members and we have people who were the um, volunteers who had the idea initially and decided that we needed an art centre or a regional gallery in the Perth Hills. Um, they had those conversations with the Shire of Mundaring and how that could make that happen. And over a glass of wine? Yes, that's right, over a couple of glasses of wine and a, and a few fantastic creative conversations about, well, what could we do? And we've got this fantastic post office facility here um, where we run our programs and those people still come back to visit our programming. Brilliant. So Jenny, you mentioned that this was a post office. How did it morph from a post office into an art center? And what, what, what does that bring uh, to this particular facility? Um, well, the art center itself started in a service station oh, and they wow. tried their very best to make that an incredible space for the community. But then we needed something a bit more and this space was available as a shire owned building. Um, beautiful old heritage space and it does bring that ambient, that ambient feel to when you visit the space. Sometimes people can feel a little bit disconnected to the arts because they walk into a sterile space. But people have said, you know, they feel like they're coming home and they can feel relaxed and they can um, move around the different areas. It's got the old floorboards, but it's also got interesting walls. And when you're hanging an exhibition, rather than it being a box, a sterile white box that the galleries can be, um, it's got little nooks and crannies for people to explore. So are many of these walls the original walls from the post office? Yes, wow. it continues to keep on growing um, and sometimes that theme about it being the post office you know, comes back into the artwork that the artists make. Um, one of our artists, Peter Daly, who's been in the area for many, many years and part of the Art Centre for many years, recently created a work for our 40th anniversary and the, all of these walls were um, patterned with um, stamps of the old post office boxes oh, wow. and he did an interactive electronic piece with a young emerging artist so it was that sort of story of the young working with the old and us working on a new work from our history so that's cyclical. 200 artists, are, yeah. are they all local? We have about 85% from the Perth yes. Hills and then we expand into the eastern region where there's artists you know from Midland as far as Ellenbrook um, but there's also, it's all West Australian handmade, but there's Fremantle artists and artists that come from further out as well. So there's a nice diversity of different mediums. That's fantastic. So um, with the type of arts that you, you know, obviously you've got um, uh, paintings, you've got um, pottery, you've got woodwork, you know, there's quite an amazing blend of different art styles in here. Mm. So uh, tell me a little bit about some of the artists that you have on display. 
So with some of our local artists, so there's local potters like um, our ceramic artists from, from Glen Forest and also Hovia. A lot of them dig clay from our local environment, wow. create it and fire it in their own studios. And in the Perth Hills each year, you know, we come alive with our open artist studios. Um, this year there were about 50 artists represented in the local area and people could visit their studios around, which is fantastic. And I know Kalamunda also has a complimentary mm. one. Um, so people really get to see see the artists working in their own environment, see that the works that they create. So we like to be, you know, the one-stop shop where they can see the great diversity of those art forms, whether it be textiles, ceramics, jewellery, um, paintings, and our exhibition spaces also provide the opportunity for that with mm. the exhibitions changing every month. So we've got the Gallery One space, um, and that's a program to make sure that there's young emerging artists, professional artists, different community shows. Um, we've recently had our Icon project, so once a year around about October, we run a project where lots of community collaborators come together on a set theme. And that way, like this year, it was called What on Earth, which was all botanical, so a um, subject that's close to lots of people's hearts with our beautiful natural environment and wildflowers. Um, and that saw, you know, over 40 partnerships with different groups which spoke of the environment and spoke of um, our history. And Susie Vickery had an exhibition in Gallery One which um, attracted record crowds. It was really um, interactive and explored a part of our WA history that hadn't been um, really highlighted before with mm. the French um, botanical exploration and documentation of our botanical species. And because it was so popular, we're talking to a few partners to see if that can tour regionally. So sometimes with our exhibitions in the space, um, when they become you know, really popular and they've got a thematic um, story to tell which will have uh, a, a broad appeal to audiences. We often will develop those into touring shows with Art on the Move mm. so they can go out to regional communities and, you know, continue oh, that story. So uh, one theme that we're getting uh, in our, our little tour of uh, the Perth Hills is that um, with the community, the, the environment is really important mm -hmm. and you've made mention uh, about that. You know, so can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, I think it's really important for a community centre because we are community arts driven with a big public program of workshops mm -hmm. and working with schools, is that we do reflect what's important to our community and what's special about our community. Um, if you look at the difference between this space and a Fremantle mm -hmm. space, it's really um, significant, you know, our heritage trails, our national parks, our beautiful waterfalls and um, watering holes, you know, there's a strong connection to water throughout the Shire with the Seaway O'Connor, with the Weir. Um, it, so to reflect those stories that are within our community, obviously the artists are attracted to them, but our audiences are too. They're not going to come here and want to learn about our shipping history. Mm. You know, they'll go to Fremantle. Yeah. So it's really important that when people come to this space, it reflects what they know or want to know about, mm. you know, the surroundings, you know, with our wonderful sculpture park that we have down the road, the sculptures within that park reflect parts of that history. and again the art centre and our exhibitions often reflect that the exhibition we have on at the moment which is a ceramic show looks about the fragility of our environment and the artists are trying to talk about how we can nurture mm. um, and rebuild and protect and that certainly is a recurring theme with a lot of the works that we have we have an annual environment art project for primary schools mm -hmm. um, and that's shown in gallery too so often that space will be used in a bit more of a community space where people can come and do workshops but also um, it's not as formal as the gallery one space so where we have fine artists working in here often community artists will work in residence and in this instance we have 980 primary school students wow. with their amazing environmental artworks which will then be transformed into banners for the city's uh, town centre. So in, in terms of um, indigenous artists up here do you have uh, quite a few indigenous artists? We don't have um, a lot of indigenous artists that live locally mm -hmm. there are a few that we have um, you know, ongoing relationships with, whether they be through the public artworks that we mm. create, uh, whether it be an advisory capacity. Um, but certainly we've got the secondary venue down in Midland and there's a higher population of Indigenous artists who we work with down in the Midland area. Fantastic. And so do you uh, run workshops? Yes, yeah. yep. so, through both venues. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And how, 
Uh, how, how are they taken up? Do you have a lot of people that show up for those? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but I think it was about um, four to 5,000 people wow. took part in just the workshop program last year. Um, and then when we have our icon projects, there's huge open days as well. So um, there's the bookable workshops where you work one-on-one -on -one with, an, well, one -on -one, usually groups of 10, with a um, visual artist. But then there's open days where we would have a number of community groups, artists, displays, mm -hmm. activities, performances that people come to. And those open days, the one in Mundaring um, recently attracted just over 2,500 people wow. to that one day. So if uh, anyone in the city wanted to maybe come up and take a workshop or, mm. um, you know, take a look at things, uh, where do they go and, and who do they speak to? Well, they can sign up to our newsletter, which is an yep. electronic MailChimp, so that they get all the regular updates, Facebook, Instagram, you know, the normal social media platforms. Um, but also, both of our websites are pretty comprehensive. So we've got the Mundaring Arts Centre website, which will link you to Midland, or the Midland Junction Arts Centre website, which will link you to Mundaring. So you can see the full exhibition program, project project program and also workshops. So all that info is there um, and people can book online. We've had a few conversations and it seems that a lot of people get directed toward the visitor center to find mm. out more about what's happening up here. Yeah, I think we're really lucky. We live in a village community and people do know each other. So the visitor center will tell people about us um, as will the library and vice versa. So people can find information from multiple sources as well as the Shire administration. So uh, with the facility being here for 40 years, do you see another 40 years? What's the legacy that you see? What would you like to see happen um, with the Mundaring Arts Centre moving into the future? I think that in today's climate when it comes to the way that the arts are supported, places like this are so vital. It's a grassroots organisation where we've discussed there are opportunities for very senior professional artists to work alongside young emerging artists and there aren't that many organisations that provide that mm -hmm. anymore. There's a reduction in the school programming and the tertiary programming on the arts. Um, so those opportunities for people to connect with the arts are being limited. Um, so yeah, community arts centres are a really vital breeding ground for new creative direction. And I hope that the arts centre can continue to do that because um, it's got a long legacy of success and I can only see that it's growing. We've got a beautiful team that works together and some fantastic partners. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Jenny, for letting us come in here and have a, having a chat with you. Um, we might take a walk around and take a look at a few things. And yeah, thank you. Please do.